these MCMC algorithms allow us to sample from these probability distributions and uh, train our Bayesian statistical models. So uh, why do you love <laughs> Markov Chain Monte Carlo so much? These type of Markov Chain Monte Carlo algorithms, um, like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or NUTS, just right. work on pretty much whatever model you throw at it. And yeah, so it's just one sampler to solve all of your problems. Um, so that's why I love it. Bayesian modeling allows you to express these things because not only are the models built out of these probability distributions, but the outputs of it, the parameter estimates, are also right. probability distributions. Right. Thomas, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm excited to have you here. Where in the world are you calling in from? Thanks, John. I'm very happy to be here and calling in from Berlin, Germany. Uh, yes. What's it like uh, as we start to get from spring into summer in Berlin? I bet there's a lot more out outdoor activities, lots of parties. <laughs> is there uh, lots of is there like sure, kind of yeah. like a outdoor drinking culture, like beer gardens and that kind of thing? Yes, a lot of that. So it feels like everything just everyone just shuts themselves in during the winter months, uh, which are just like gray and rainy and like typical what you would think of of German weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, then when spring comes around, everyone gets excited and uh, goes outside. And uh, yeah, uh, the, there's a lot of daylight hours. So there's sun and light out uh, deep into the evening. So that makes for very, very good uh, beer garden sessions. Nice. Yeah, I have actually never been to Berlin, but it seems like a wonderful place to live. I've had a lot of friends go out there and they say that it's just fabulous. Um, you haven't always been in New York. You did a PhD in at Brown University, which is in Rhode Island in the Northeast US. Um, and then you were at Quantopian after that. And that's, is Quantopian, were you based in New York? Are they in New York? They're based in Boston. In Boston. Um, but yeah, that's right. So I did my undergrad in Tübingen, Germany, which uh, is home to the Max Planck Institute there, where a lot of really cool deep learning research is being done. And that really motivated me to yeah explore more science and that brought me to to brown providence and yeah it's a really cool city um I, i'm pausing i mean the city is really cool because brown is amazing um <laughs> and it's cool also because it's close to new york and boston which i really enjoyed and yeah once a week i would uh go up to boston to work at the quantopian offices and uh and, and have a good time there and then, yeah, you spent a long time there, um, and we'll get into that a bit later. But yeah, I just want to give a kind of a sense of geographies there. And I guess Germany was calling you back, and Berlin seems like a great place to be in the world for tech in general anyway. Yes. So cool choice. Um, yeah. So we know each other. Oh, yeah, I bet. Um, so we know each other through Reshma Sheikh, who I have known in New York for nine years. And Reshima was instrumental in helping me kick off my public data science speaking career. So on my website, if you go to johncrone.com slash talks and you scroll back to like 2013 when I met Reshima, I was doing like, well, at one point I was doing zero talks, like 2011, 2012 is like nothing. And then 2013, um, I met Reshima doing, when I was doing one of my first talks, public talks on data science ever. And then she started getting me involved with more uh, data science meetup networks. And so you'll see they start to like increase exponentially from that year. And now it's well over 100 talks a year for the last few years. And Reshima wow. was key to that initial uh, explosion of opportunities. So I'm super grateful to her. She is a invaluable hub in the New York data science community. She is involved in so many different data science and machine learning communities. It's super cool. And it sounds like she now is doing some work for you. That's right, yeah. So as part of uh, the PIMC project, which I'm sure we'll also talk about, uh, which is open source. So we did with Data Umbrella, her organization, uh, a shared event where we uh, had talks and hackathons just to get the community together. And that's how I met her. And I was just really blown away by her uh, capacity yeah, to community build and uh, 
do social media outreach and all of that. And I was like, well, that that is really amazing and a skill set that is very rare to find, right? Someone who really has knows open source, knows statistics, right? So yeah. she's a, like a properly trained statistician. Yeah. Um, but then also like knows about social media and marketing. So I then uh, tried recruiting her for PyMC Labs, the company um, that, that I run that is based on the software. And uh, so I asked her and she said, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, over time, I sort of wore her down to like now uh, work with us and do like really cool stuff with PyMC and PyMC Labs. So yeah, she's been invaluable to the community and also to the, the project and the company. Awesome. So let's talk about both of those things now. Let's talk about PyMC first. So PyMC is an open source library for doing Bayesian statistics. I have used it in the past, but when I used it, uh, it was called PyMC3. So maybe you can give us a quick introduction to what Bayesian statistics is, and then also tell us about this library formerly known as PyMC3, now known as PyMC. Sure. So yeah, Bayesian statistics or Bayesian modeling for me is a fundamentally different approach to doing data science, specifically when you compare it to things like machine learning. So machine learning for me is like very much, well, you have sort of one, one tool and that you just pump in data and outcomes predictions. And often that is why it's called black box uh, because the, the thing that gets trained, you don't really know what's going on underneath, right? So the predictions come out and oftentimes they're quite good if you like, did everything correctly. Uh, but that if you can't really inquire the model and understand why it came up with this, uh, it's very hard to really gain insight about your data and, and, and learn yourself about the type of things that are going on. And that for me just disqualifies it for a lot of applied business problems, which is what I care about. Um, because there, when you tell your manager like, oh, like uh, we should be increasing our media spend by um, 100%, uh, I can't tell you why, but like the, <laughs> the black box said we should, like right. that often doesn't fly as well. So Bayesian modeling instead is like what I like to call the Lego approach where you build a particular model for a particular purpose. Uh, so you customize it for this thing and it's then like hand tailored for this data science problem that you're working with. Um, just like with Lego, right? So you, you like buy the spaceship thing and you can build the spaceship with it, but you can also build a robot or whatever it is that you really mm -hmm. want. Um, and the building blocks that you're using to build this up are probability distributions. So fundamentally that is sort of what we're doing and we're plugging things into, into each other and basically mapping the business problem or the, the, the research problem, uh, the, the, the process of how the data was generated, we map that into a model. And then this model essentially is capable of generating new data that uh, we might observe. And once you have that, right, so you have the forward model, you can then say, okay, well, now that I know how, um, now that I have modeled the data generating process, how can I invert that to say, okay, given the data I actually have observed, how can I reason my way backwards now to the hidden causes that I actually care about? Like, for example, how effective was that media channel um, in, in driving sales, uh, which is a thing that I can't observe, right? I can only observe the downstream effects. Um, so Bayesian modeling is just really, really good at that. And um, it's like one thing that is often also mentioned as like a key benefit um, is that it is very principled about how uncertainty is quantified. So again, with machine learning, usually you get like the, the best fitting uh, solution and the most likely answer to your solution. And I mean, that's cool in some cases, but often, uh, let's say you're in a medical situation, um, probably you don't just want to say like, yes, that is cancer or not cancer. You want to have some probability you want to have some uncertainty, right? Like if it's based on like very little data, probably you're just going to say, well, I can't say, right? I don't have an answer for this, which is like a perfectly reasonable thing to do in the absence of data. Um, and Bayesian modeling allows you to express these things because not only are the models built out of these probability distributions, but the outputs of it, the parameter estimates are also right. probability distributions. Right. So 
that is like the core principle is we are quantifying uncertainty with probabilities. And that's, uh, for me, the most intuitive way of going about doing that. Um, but really, the other thing that I think for me makes it so powerful is uh, when you actually go about doing that, right? So, so far, what I described is just the theory and that is like hundreds of years old. Um, but it never has been really possible to use this like beautiful theory in practice just because the math uh, is just really, really gnarly when you uh, go about doing it and like building your own model, right? So now with uh, estimation algorithms, so we can solve it analytically, but we can estimate the solution. We can estimate these probability distributions that we're interested in that are our answers um, using a very general class of algorithms called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. And those then allow you to automate the fitting process, the estimation process, um, which is one piece of the puzzle. But the other piece of the puzzle is, well, how do I even build the models, right? So I just said that the core strength of this is that we can build customized models for a particular data science problem. And that's where the power of probabilistic programming comes in, um, which is packages like PyMC or Stan or NumPyro. And they allow you to write in computer code, in the case of PyMC, it's Python code, um, a statistical model where you say, well, I have a variable, for example, that tracks the effectiveness of that media channel. I have another one that tracks um, how that media channel interacts with this other one. And you just have these parameters specified, how they interact with each other, and then how they relate to the outputs, right? That's how the, the generative process works uh, from like unobservable causes down to data. Um, so you write that out like you would a Python program that generates data, right? You just have um, yeah, individual nodes in that graph that um, interact and generate the data. And once you have coded that, then you just hit that, what I like to call the inference button, uh, which runs that estimation algorithm, no matter what, uh, what model you threw at it, and then you get your answers. So, so that for me is the, really the superpower of Bayesian modeling these days is that we have really powerful tools that automate this whole workflow and make it very iterative so that we can go in, build a model, a very simple model, see where it's lacking, improve it, just like writing program, right? You start simple and you improve it. Um, so now we can have that very powerful workflow just applied to statistical modeling. This episode of Super Data Science is brought to you by Z by HP. Get rapid results from your most demanding data sets, train data models, and create data visualizations with Z data science machines, which come in both laptop and desktop workstation options. The Data Science Stack Manager on the Z by HP machines provides convenient access to popular tools and updates them automatically. So this helps you customize your environment easily on either Windows or Ubuntu. Find out more at hp.com slash data science. That's hp.com slash data science. All right, now back to our show. Nice, so yeah, so we have this field of research, Bayesian statistics, these theoretical concepts that are, as you say, hundreds of years old, but it isn't until the advent of computing in the last few decades that we can make really good use of this theory efficiently because it's computationally in intensive to be doing this kind of probability distribution sampling that you're describing. And as we start to add more nodes into our computational graph, um, it becomes way, way, way more complicated. And so uh, until we had compute in the last few decades, and now as compute gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper exponentially, it opens, just like it's opened the door for machine learning, it has also opened this uh, this, this very old mathematical approach. It's opened the door for it to become widely useful in a broad range of applications. I love the way that you describe it as the Lego approach to building a model um, where you, you understand what each of these nodes are. You can be quite prescriptive about how information flows between the nodes as well as the characteristics of each of the components um, in the model. So you can be uh, relatively prescriptive or unprescriptive about the shape, the center of a distribution, um, the variance of a distribution, um, 
yeah, you can be relatively agnostic about some aspects of it, or you can be very specific. You could say, okay, based on this, uh, this previous information that I have that I know from this research paper or from my experience, I have a pretty good idea of how this particular part of the model should behave. So I'm going to uh, seed it with this prior distribution. And then um, you can use data to make adjustments to that distribution and other distributions in your model. It is, yeah, really cool. That kind of building, that Lego building block idea of saying like, okay, I've got a long yellow block here and I've got like a small red block over here. And this is how they're, this, these are the pieces that are connected. That's a really cool kind of visual of how we can link together all these different probability distributions. And then, yeah, something that makes Bayesian statistics, you already alluded to this, but I want to say it again to highlight it for listeners that aren't already aware of Bayesian statistics. The, the thing that separates it from any other approach that I'm aware of is that the outputs are probability distributions. You don't get a scalar value as an output. You have probability distributions, um, which means that uh, you can interpret those in a much more nuanced way than just some scalar value. Right. Yeah, exactly. That is often where people really start to get it once you're like, well, yeah, why should we just have to make a single prediction when we can make a whole variety of uh, predictions, a whole distribution of predictions according to how plausible each of those outcomes are, yeah. right? So, and, and that is often a key turning point. And I really like what you said about the computational revolution that sort of was underlying this. And that, that continues to be like a major driver of these tools and one in particular where PIMC has been really big on is um, using new computational backends. So um, you, before you mentioned that there's like PIMC3 and uh, now we ran to PIMC, uh, we did that because there's a new version coming out called PIMC 4.0. Uh, so we didn't want to have PIMC3 4.0, which sounds <laughs> so weird. Um, so PIMC 4.0 uh, will be the successor and we've been working on it for like a really long time. And one of the coolest new features, uh, there are many, but one of the coolest ones is that we now can um, have the model that you build and then run it on different computational backends. So before the computational backend was, we would take the model, compile it to C, compile it to machine code to make it fast. But now we can, for example, also compile it to JAX, um, which is a really awesome new compute library from Google. And that uh, leads to like incredible speed ups. Um, so on the CPU, we're seeing speed ups like three to five times, but you can also now take that model and run it on the GPU. And there we see speed ups of like 20 X and higher uh, uh, without like having to do anything. So I think, yeah, there's like, well, at least three stages. Um, there's the first one where like, it was just like completely intractable. Then like, other tools came around like Winbugs and, uh, and Jax that made it work for like small models. But now uh, the type of models that, we're, that we are building for clients at PyMC Labs are like massive in scale. They have like hundreds of thousands of parameters and work on millions of data points. Um, like really, really complicated um, real world models. And nonetheless, they estimate in like under one hour. So that is really. Uh, I think something that not everyone has realized yet is that this is not just um, useful toy for small data problems um, with like very few parameters, but actually, no, you can like build insanely complex models on fairly large data sets. Nice. Right, so we will get to that. We'll talk about PyMC Labs and the consulting that you're doing with these big models, get into a few use cases. Before we get there, Let's dig a bit more into the PyMC library. So when people set about doing Bayesian statistics, the PyMC library is one of the clear, most popular choices for getting started and doing it in Python. Um, there are alternatives out there. So maybe it would be helpful to kind of explain why, like what the difference is between PyMC and some of the other libraries. So in episode number 507, we had Rob Tranguchi on the podcast talking about Bayesian statistics, and he's a core developer on the Stan team. So uh, we talked a lot about Stan and the approach to that library 
um, in that episode. So maybe you can kind of compare and contrast what makes PyMC different from Stan or other ways of uh, training a Bayesian model. Sure, yeah. So Stan is an amazing package and uh, it's, they started around the same time developing it uh, than, than we did with PyMC3. And yeah, so and a lot of their functionality and tools and inference arguments we just copied from them. So <laughs> you find a lot of huge influence from Stan oh, and cool. PyMC3 and, and they were helping us early on and, and continue to do so. So we're really, uh, yeah, th they're awesome and they are the ones who like are pushing this field forward a lot. Um, and, uh, so yeah, and I really like the library. There are definitely a couple of like very core differences in terms of choice, in terms of technical choices. Philosophical um, differences. I think the main one, uh, yeah, if, if you want to call it that. Um, and one of them is that they initially, I think really targeted R, um, which is correct. Um, where a lot of the statisticians, uh, still operate in especially the academic ones. Mm -hmm. And um, and they also followed this, I guess, inherited approach from other systems like Winbox, I mentioned before, Jax, where you have a specific language um, that is custom to the probabilistic programming system that you're working with. And so it's like its own language that you're writing these models in. And that has its benefits uh, in terms of expressibility but it has its downside in terms of like this just being, for example, by now there are things like PyStan or CommandStan uh, that allow you to also run models in Python, that's fine. But the model code itself would be just a string, right? Um, that you then pass to this like system that runs on C um, somewhere else, so not in Python. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's cool that you can run it from all these different um, packages, uh, from all these different languages. But yeah, um, I think, the uh, for me, I mean, I'm I'm not a statistician. I have a coding background, so and I always have been coding in Python. So the thing that I love about Python is that it's it's the glue, right? And everything just it sticks to everything. So mm -hmm. everything I can do from within Python and in Python. So for me, uh, not being able to write my model in Python um, is, is a downside because I really want to be able to, yeah. Um, use the same syntax I use for everything else, for plotting, for data input, outputting, and and then for writing my model. And that then, of course, translates to other things like uh, just interoperability with the rest of the Python ecosystem, um, where it's it's really just a library and not a framework. And so, in terms of like deployability and, and those types of things, it just uh, hooks nicer in there. And I guess related to that is also that um, we have built it on top of the Theano library, which was like TensorFlow uh, before it was cool. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, well, I guess TensorFlow isn't cool anymore either, but um, now we <laughs> The statement is still um, true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and... Um, so and Theano was really like uh, so far ahead of its time. Uh, and it's like that first library, right, where you can write these, well, focus on deep learning models and you build up a computational graph. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was John Salvatier, who is like the, the actual uh, originator of PyMC3, who like thought like, oh, wait a second, like we have this graph computation library that people have written for deep learning. Couldn't we use that for probability programming? And, um, and like that was, I think the, the, like absolutely central idea, right? I mean, by now there are other packages like Numpyro or Jax that build on these. So it's very standard by now, but by back then it was like revolutionary. And that approach really, um, allowed a lot of other technical innovations. I think, uh, like I just mentioned with PyMC4, right? So if we have PyMC, which is really just 100% pure Python code. But it's not slow because it's building on top of Theano, um, which is that library that is building up that computational graph. And then once you have that computational graph representation, which is the mathematical terms, uh, just like of your model evaluation function, mm -hmm. you can do all kinds of cool shit with that. You can simplify that and like do mathematical simplification. If there's a log of an X of X, well, you just turn that into an X or a lot of other cool things. And 
So you do these optimizations on the compute graph, and then you take that compute graph and you compile it to C or JAX, which is the new thing. Um, and the other thing I, I want to mention there is that I talked about Theano, which uh, was discontinued, which was actually uh, quite a bummer for us. Yeah, with the, but, the 1.0 uh, release was also the like final release many years ago. Yeah, exactly. They're like, we're done with this. Like it's uh, as good as it's going to yeah, get. It's, I, my understanding um, of that is that it isn't so much to do with the library being unsuccessful, but it's that so many of the people, Fiona was largely a project, a project out of the University of Montreal, and all the people that were working on it got hired by Google. And <laughs> those people were then at Google working on TensorFlow. And so it didn't make sense to be continuing to develop Fiona uh, when they were now all these people are working on TensorFlow. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. And for us, we were like, okay, well, maybe let's explore TensorFlow. But um, we we did, and uh, it turns out it wasn't really a good fit for, uh, I think, probability programming in general, because they, just like Py, uh, PyTorch, also followed this dynamic graph approach, um, which by now, like, these libraries do. Right. And that turned out to be a real pain, actually. Um, so Theano is, was different because they didn't allow for, like, changing like having this dynamic graph that is just like you run the program and it's creating it on the fly mm -hmm. but rather you specify it once ahead of time and then you have it and then you can do all the stuff that i just mentioned with the simplification of the compilation um and that actually is a really cool feature we found um and that has caused us to say like actually theano is like such an amazing system uh yes it's like uh had a lot of like technical debt accumulate over the years but um Brendan Willard, who uh, is afraid of nothing, was like, okay, well, I can handle this. So he took that library and just like completely revamped it, rewrote it, um, threw out like a lot of uh, stuff that had accrued mm -hmm. and added cool new functionality, like cool new functionality, like the JAX backend or number backend. Uh, so made it like a really modern, uh, powerful library that focuses on uh, these type of things. And now it's called Asara, which is in Greek mythology, the daughter of Theano. So that uh, makes sense too. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's so cool. Asara, A-S-A-R-A? A-E-S-A-R-A. -A -A. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. So and just so really quickly while IMC we're doing, just really quickly while we're doing spellings of things, a number of times you've mentioned Numba, which is N-U-M-B-A. Um, yeah. And then you've also mentioned Jags. And so I know that there was a Bayesian library, computational library, J-A-G-S. Ah, but you're also correct. talking about right. JAX, JAX, right? J-A-X. And so this whole time yes. that you've been talking, you've only been talking about the latter, right? J-A-X? That is correct. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So okay. once, when I mentioned the historical context of like the old uh, languages, yes. that's where I mean the Windbugs and JAGs. Right. Uh, but every time since then, it's JAX, the Google... Um, yeah, uh, computational, like the, the the new TensorFlow, basically. Cool. Awesome. All right. We got all that. All right. And then you were about to talk about IMC 4.0, and I interrupted you to make sure that I was on track with all the acronyms. All right. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. And then, so PyMC 4, uh, by the time this recording will be released, I, um, I okay, well, I will just go on the air and say it, it will be released by then. Um, so now I have to follow through. So we actually have a hackathon schedule to just like get it out because it's been too long. It will be out. And uh, that is then now based on Arasara. Um, and so it has like all the cool functionality that is now in there. Um, specifically, like I mentioned, the JAX and the GPU support. Um, but then it has like all kinds of other cool new uh, features as well that we're really excited about. So. Can't wait to get that out and, uh, yeah, really continue to push uh, what's possible in probabilistic programming. Super cool. That was a great orientation to what PyMC is vis-a-vis -vis its history and relationship to previous computational libraries, coming computational libraries, uh, the state of the art in Bayesian statistics and graph computation in general. Um, which is cool. It's a while Bayesian statistics and machine learning are different kinds of approaches for working with and modeling data. It's cool to think that 
so much of the underlying infrastructure can actually be common between the two um, in terms of yeah solving yeah. a computational graph. Right, exactly. We're really standing on the shoulders of giants now um, because, yeah, I mean, these uh, innovations are so powerful. And now, yeah, through this like more flexible middle layer of our Sara, uh, we can just like directly make use of that. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Super, super cool. All right. So we now have some sense of <laughs> what Bayesian statistics is. We know about the PyMC library for training our own Bayesian statistical models uh, and being able to draw conclusions from data with those models. So um, at the height of the pandemic in 2020, you were working at, a, at Quantopian, which we mentioned earlier, which is um, a quant finance company. You left them to create your own consultancy. And we've mentioned the name of that consultancy actually earlier in this episode already, IMC Labs. <laughs> Um, and so it's, there's this clear connection between the PyMC library and PyMC Labs that you're now CEO of. Um, so why was it the right time for you to assemble uh, what you called in a blog post your Bayesian Avengers um, into <laughs> this uh, commercial entity to start solving advanced analytical problems with Bayesian statistics? Yeah, I love the introduction you gave. Um, so it happened really, well, two things came together. One was uh, inside of the PyMC development team. Uh, I mean, this library, we've been programming on it for a long time. And we have managed to attract a lot of like really amazing programmers, statisticians, data scientists. Uh, and um, the, the barrier of entry in terms of like contributing to that library is fairly high. So that like attracts mm -hmm. the right kind of people who like are up for a challenge. And we just all really loved working together. And we had like these in-person meetings um, and just start becoming friends really uh, who loved working together on like testing and modeling. And for many years prior to that, we all had this dream. We're like, oh, well, wouldn't it be awesome to A, work together, but B, also to use these tools to solve applied business problems. And that was really an open question at that time because, well, is there even a demand for that? Everyone was just doing machine learning and deep learning. Did people even understand or and, and want that? Um, so we didn't know. But um, yeah, after I had left Quantopian, I just started getting inbound interest in terms of companies contacting me and being like, oh yeah, I heard you like um, are just not doing that anymore. Uh, <laughs> we are using PyMC and we could use some help, or we heard about Bayesian modeling, heard it's really cool, we think it could be a good fit for a problem. Uh, can you help us with that? And I was like, well, sure. Um, let me first, however, assemble uh, a team for Bayesian <laughs> Avengers. Um, one in our team likes to call it the Bevengers. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, so yeah, basically, it, it, was, it was pretty easy from that point on. Uh, it was basically like in the Blues Brothers movie um, where I just went to everyone and was like, we're getting the band back together. Let's do this. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, everyone was just uh, on board immediately. So it's really just uh, a, a couple of the um, PyMC core developers that, we've, that I've been working with for a long time. And we all just were really excited about doing that for a long time. And then we now had actually people requesting those services. So we were just like, well, let's try it out. And it turned out for many people in the PyMC core team also to be an opportune time because a lot of them were frustrated with like big corporate jobs. So they were uh, more than happy to build, to like uh, join this garage band type of uh, <laughs> company that we were building and, and just work on really amazing, challenging, Bayesian modeling problems together. Super cool. I love that story. And then so how's it been going? Uh, it sounds like there's been a lot of traction, a lot of inbound interest. People who are using the PyMC library saw value uh, in working with people that could be the best and uh, maybe solve their problems better than they could. It reminds me a little bit, we had on the show last year, we had Wes McKinney, 
in episode 523. And so this kind of reminds me of how, so Wes McKinney created the Pandas library, which is ubiquitous, but more recently he's been developing the Apache Arrow library and he created Voltron Data as a company that can then help people um, use Apache Arrow most effectively. So there's, so this kind of reminds me of that situation where you have this amazing open source library, IMC, you've got the best developers working on it already and now you can take advantage of these did not take advantage <laughs> uh, you can use uh yeah you can take advantage of their amazing skill sets um yeah, not take cool. advantage of these people uh take advantage yeah. of their amazing skill sets um to be solving commercial problems and um this probably just like in that voltron data case it probably helps pymc as well because when you have commercial applications, not only does it broaden the reach of people who are aware of these techniques, but it is also literally bringing funding in that allows you to support the open source project. Yes, definitely. And so that was really important for us in launching this company is that it, um, it really should be beneficial to PyMC because that's really the main thing that we all care about. And, and that has really turned out to be true. So yeah, there have been a couple of important learnings doing this. Um, yeah, you already alluded to it that like there's yeah all this inbound interest. So the first big surprise was, uh, well, yeah, a lot of companies, uh, startups, but also like really big Fortune 500 companies are using PyMC. I never knew about them before. Um, the downsides of open sources, you just give it away. So uh, people don't really come back to you only when it's not working. <laughs> So uh, now we had this different channel where, well, people were still coming to us if they wanted to like um, scale it. Um, but yeah, so it was like much wider use than I had ever anticipated. And, and yeah, a lot of those companies were looking for experts in um, using either the library to solve a new problem or a lot of times they already had used it and were like, okay, well, we like this model, but can you make it faster? Um, can you add hierarchy here can you make it more fancy more powerful and um yeah so it really has taken a much stronger foothold in business and industry than uh, i had originally thought so that's amazing and the other thing is that by using this library in this context we really see the the lack of the library in many cases so by using it for real world data data science problems we're like okay well um, really, this type of uh, new technique uh, is is really useful. Yeah, the shortcuts. Let's contribute that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then we go in and fix that, which is great for everyone, right? Because so we now make the library better for that particular customer, optimizing it for their use case, and but also, of course, for the more for for everyone else, right? The whole community. Um, and and yeah, really pushing the the, the software, the package to its limits. And, and beyond that, because, well, as the core developers, we can improve it ourselves and make it do the thing that it needs to do, which it might not have been possible to do before. So in that sense, yeah, it has been usually beneficial to the library. Um, and in, yeah, um, and also, of course, just in, yeah, providing more funding, as you said, for actually uh, now, like now we're able to pay people to work on open source. Um, right. So, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I like that you mentioned Wes McKinney, who also like has been really um, always really trying to integrate the two uh, open source and how can we have more business support for it and more funding. And yeah, there's there's like a lot to explore and 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 a lot of benefit to uncover. So I think we're still at the starting point of that. But yeah, all these companies. Um, also Anaconda, who are just like mm -hmm. really helping the ecosystem. So I think, yeah, that needs to be embraced even more. And and I can't wait to see more companies forming around open source packages. Super cool. Yeah, I love it. It's a benefit to everyone. We have more people being paid. If the best people, instead of working at a hedge fund, like Wes McKinney is a perfect example. He was at yeah. Two Sigma big hedge fund. And even, even when he was making pandas, he was working in finance. Uh, and so he, to make pandas, he left his finance job, which he'd had for a couple of years, 
So he was like living frugally in New York, um, working for this hedge fund and was able to save up, save up enough money to then leave working and develop pandas full time for a while. And very few people can afford that luxury. <laughs> it's not like yeah. that's not a sustainable business model by definition. Um, and then he was very fortunate to later be working at Two Sigma, where you know the super successful hedge fund. Uh, it seems like they were happy for him to spend a lot of his time developing open source uh, work. But that again, that is the exception. So it's wonderful to be able to have consultancies like this and like Anaconda you mentioned that allow you to have people make a reasonable living. They don't have to be in a corporate job or at a hedge fund. They can be doing what they love, which is developing these super powerful open source libraries that then everyone in real time as you create updates and you upload them to GitHub, then everyone can benefit in real time from the amazing work that all of you folks are doing. So yeah, I love this general trend that we're seeing in data science with open source libraries. And I am glad that you're doing it. And I can't wait to see where it continues to grow. Yeah. Um, so do you have any specific examples? We Earlier, we alluded to this idea of having very big Bayesian models um, and that you have some clients at PyMC Labs that are taking advantage of these huge models um, that thanks to technologies like JAX, were able to uh, to converge on a solution with these very large models in a relatively short period of time. So maybe you have a couple of interesting case studies from PyMC Labs that you can share with us. Sure, I'd love to. So yeah, one of the case studies I really like is the work that we do with HelloFresh, um, which is like a huge uh, multi-million dollar food delivery company. Mm -hmm. And like every, almost every other company on the planet, they have, a, they invest a lot in online marketing, right? Because that's how you get customers. And I guess maybe as a general point, this is something that uh, has been really surprising to me in uh, creating PyMC Labs is that uh, a lot of our customers actually are from online marketing. So as an industry, marketing seems to be at the forefront of embracing Bayesian modeling. And I think there's many good reasons for that. Um, and one of them actually is that it's becoming harder and harder in online marketing to actually see what's going on uh, because everyone's getting more privacy conscious, uh, the death of the cookie where you can't track people. Um, they don't like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how do you know whether your marketing is working or not if you can't really, if you don't have the information you used to have? Um, and that's where a class of models called marketing mix models uh, have been really embraced have have been embraced more and more and that is what HelloFresh had already built so there's a uh, popular paper out of google actually that describes a bayesian version of this media mix model and the problem that it solves is well you have um marketing money, uh, the problem that it solves is that you have money that you spend on marketing on different channels right so you have uh 10 million 10 million you spend on Google ads and then uh, five on Facebook ads and Twitter, but also TV and radio and podcasts and influencers, right? There's like all these different channels that you can spend money on. And of course, you want to know how good is each one of them working. But it's very hard to know that exactly. Usually the only thing you observe is, well, this is how much was spending on that day on that channel. And this is how much user I got in total from all these different things I'm doing, right? So you have many input variables and just only one output variable in trying to reverse that, which at the core already sounds like a very statistical problem, and it is. Um, and it might actually sound like a deceivingly simple problem at first. We're like, oh, well, that sounds like just a linear regression. And at the core, that's what it is, but there's like so many complexities once you actually get down to it. Um, for example, if you just keep increasing marketing spend on a channel. Uh, it's not that you just like, we'll get more and more users and it just like keeps growing linearly. There's a saturation function, right? Like after a while, users who've seen the ad now five times uh, probably will get turned off even at some point, um, but they're just not gonna be um, more likely to, to sign up or buy a product. Um, so this media mix model, MMM, that I uh, mentioned 
has all these complexities already in there and uh, HelloFresh had this model built and then uh, came to us to uh, improve it basically. And uh, this is like the work that we've done with uh, Luca Fiaschi. And there we came into, and this is how actually a lot of our projects go. Like at first we're like, okay, well, the model takes 30 minutes to run and now let's take it apart. Um, um, push the dust out and uh, put it back <laughs> together. And then it works in like three minutes. Mm. And during that process, we then learn, well, actually there's a lot of other things that we can do here. Uh, like for example, well, these different marketing channels, right? Um, they are not all completely dependent, right? So if you're spending, let's say a hundred dollars to acquire a single custom on Google, um, probably on Facebook, we also have to spend around $100 to get a single customer, just making up numbers. Mm -hmm. But the point is that probably the effectiveness of these channels will be very similar. And well, listeners who already are familiar with Bayesian modeling will probably know the solution to that because it's a very common trick of Bayesians to say, well, we can build a hierarchical model now mm -hmm. where we say, well, um, we have each individual channel and we model each individually, but we also actually have a higher level distribution, which models the similarities between them. So uh, yeah, we, we model the individual ones and we model the similarities. So if one of them is at a hundred, well, let's say nine channels are around a hundred dollars and then I have a new channel that I just turn on and it is, if I were to estimate it independently, it would say it's a thousand dollars, right? So something completely different. In that case, the model will say, well, actually no, I know that all of these other ones are like in the ballpark of hundred dollars. So let me just like downregulate that. Um, I'm not going to believe that because I know that it's like going to be similar to these. So, so that is one of the things, but then you can go arbitrarily more complex as well, where, well, um, so far what I described is that these, the effectiveness of these channels are constant over time, right? So, um, the, custom acquisition cost uh, will always be $100 on Google, no matter what, right? But obviously that's wrong. Uh, during COVID, uh, that threw everything out of whack and things changed a lot. So these, change, these things are changing over time. So then we went in and built, uh, we put time varying parameters onto these. So not is it constant over time, but now it's actually allowed to change slowly over time. And, uh, for the expert Bayesians uh, uh, listeners, we use Gaussian processes to model this. And, um, and then, yeah, so things like COVID, you can model where like things go down. But as you can imagine, well, they're probably all going to go down, right, during COVID. Like these shocks don't just, well, some shocks might affect just a single channel, but others might affect all of them. Mm -hmm. So there again, that idea of hierarchy is still totally valid. So now we don't just have, all these individual media channels um, model as time series, but also have a hierarchy on that and allow um, yeah, for the, the similarities between the changes over time to also be modeled by this global process um, that's also time changing. So this, like you can see, it might get confusing at this point, but that's sort of the point is uh, that these models can become like really, really complex and large scale and yeah, model all these intricacies that you have in your data. But nonetheless, we sample this model um, on the GPU in a couple of minutes. So um, it's, uh, yeah, once, once it's built and sort of structured in a way to where it's um, amendable to sampling, which is, isn't always easy, right? So it's easy to build a model, but it's not easy to build a correct model that actually works. But once we have done that, um, yeah, you can just scale it. Um, and yeah, that's a model with like tens of thousands of parameters and, and a whole lot of data. So, uh, yeah, that's one case study. There are other ones, um, but yeah. Super cool example, Thomas. I love that HelloFresh example. You worked in hierarchical modeling, which is something that I wanted to make sure we talked about in the episode. So now we've done it. You managed to talk about working with very large scale data and just in general, this was a very elegant application. This uh, media mix model is a really cool application of Bayesian stats. And I think it gives listeners 
a great flavor of what's possible. This kind of like going back to your idea of these Lego building blocks by having this level of control over the hierarchy and the relationship between various aspects of your data. This is something that um, is unparalleled um, relative to other kinds of modeling approaches. So excellent example. Now, something that I can't believe we haven't talked about yet in this episode is MC. <laughs> so we have the PyMC library and PyMC labs. And so the Py is Python, um, but the MC, we haven't talked about that. So your blog is called While My MCMC Gently Samples uh, in a, a reference to the Eric Clapton song. Um, and Josh so, Harris, I think. oh, did Clapton cover it? It's one way or the other. So they're both famous oh, for okay. playing it. Um, okay. I think Clapton may have written it and then, and he has a version, but then George Harrison has a version as well. They also, oh, okay. the two of them had a complex love triangle with a woman whose name I forget. Um, oh, no, so, I, yeah, yeah, they, I have no idea. Yeah, they were really tight, and I can't remember if I if I'm remembering all this correctly. And like I'm stretching, there's probably listeners out there that are like shuddering because they really know the Beatles well or Clapton well or something. But <laughs> um, my memory of this is that George Harrison, it was George Harrison's partner, and Eric Clapton was friends with George Harrison, and this woman ended up leaving George for Eric. Um, but George Harrison is this, he, he did a lot of meditation. He was a very spiritual guy. And my understanding of that situation was that he really accepted it. And I think he then got along well with Eric and his ex-partner still. Um, hmm. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm most of this I'm pulling from, there's a Martin Scorsese biography of George Harrison called no way i think it's all things must pass or something like that huh. or no that's the name of a george harrison album i can't remember the name of the martin scorsese movie but there is and i'll find it and put it in the show notes there's a martin scorsese nice. film about george harrison that is uh really good um and i watched it like 10 years ago when it came out and everything that i'm telling you i'm trying to remember from that so hopefully i got at least the broad yeah. strokes right um anyway nice. <laughs> the data science podcast the host for data science and Beatles trivia. <laughs> we got all sorts here, man. Um, but so yeah, while my guitar oh, gently weeps is the song by either Harrison or Clapton or somebody else, but both of them played it. And um, you have a blog called while my MC MC gently samples. And it has lots of fun articles that, um, that listeners should check out. We'll be sure to include a link to your blog in the show notes as well. And so the MCMC MC in while my MCMC MC gently samples uh, is related to the MC, I can only imagine, in Pi MC. And it stands for Markov right. Chain Monte Carlo, which is a class of algorithms that sample from probability distributions. So we've talked a lot in this episode about how Bayesian statistics makes use of probability distributions, and we need to be able to sample from them. And so these MCMC MC algorithms allow us to sample from these probability distributions and uh, train our Bayesian statistical models. So uh, why do you love <laughs> Markov chain Monte Carlo so much? Um, I can guess it's related to Bayesian stats, but um, I think we could also, you might even be aware, be aware of applications beyond just Bayesian stats that data scientists should be aware of MCMC for. Sure, yeah. So. Um... I once read um, a guide on how to prepare for interviews and like this type of questions. I actually never had a technical interview in my life, but uh, <laughs> when I read that, I, uh, one of the questions was like, well, describe your favorite algorithm, um, which is what the interviewer oh, would ask yeah. in the interview. Right. So I was like, oh, that's a great question. Uh, and like, I knew immediately what my answer would be, uh, <laughs> and that would be the MCMC algorithm. So yeah, I just love it um, because it's so... Um, elegant in a way where, I mean, okay, so the problem that it solves is you have this probability distribution 
Um, and it can be whatever probability distribution it, it, it can be. So it's not tied to Bayesian modeling, but in Bayesian modeling, it often occurs because that posterior distribution, that uh, the, the holy uh, grail, the thing that we're after in Bayesian modeling, right? The thing that is our, gives us our uncertainty estimates, um, that is often intractable, right? So that's, again, what we said before, right. that, uh, yeah, it's like really nice theory, but analytically, it just doesn't work. So we need that inference button, and that inference button is MCMC, and it takes this problem that is like uh, analytically completely intractable, and then you say, well, if I can't like solve something analytically, well, maybe I can sample from it, right? And if I can have samples, then I can approximate it, I'll just do a histogram, and that will look similar to that solution that I can't get directly. Um, so then you're like, okay, well, let's try and sample, but uh, that turns out to be even harder, right? So if you can't analytically evaluate a function, um, it turns out you also can't like usually sample from it in like the, the standard ways. So then it's like, well, what if instead we were to like have a Markov chain uh, that has as the target distribution, uh, that has this stationary distribution, the target distribution. I fu I'm fully aware that what I just said sounds completely insane, <laughs> and it is. Because that sounds, it sounds insane and it actually sort of is like, I mean, I have this distribution, I can't solve it, I can't sample from it directly. Now you're telling me I have to do this like crazy thing with like Markov chain. That sounds even harder. Uh, so <laughs> how's that ever going to work? But the amazing thing is that that is like actually super trivial. Um, like you just have this like algorithm and I write about this in this blog post, uh, MCMC sampling for dummies where basically started out with like this mathematical description, which is what everyone does with like the station distribution, the tire distribution, which like no one understands. Like, um, but yeah, mathematicians just like to give it to you straight. And, um, and then I spend like uh, many pages explaining what that actually means in more intuitive terms. So it's by far the most successful one, which I was quite surprised by. Uh, but yeah, so that was, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, and yeah, so it's this thing that like does something that is like crazy difficult and sounds insane, but actually uh, solves the problem in a very general way with a very simple method. Um, and it has like all these applications. So with, uh, and that is the thing that like, usually when you write your PyMC model or whatever you use when you have your Bayesian model, um, the sampling algorithm that people develop is like tied to that model. Um, so <laughs> econ economics, that whole field, they still love to do that. They're just like, a lot of their papers are like, here's a very simple model. Um, let me now have like all these very complex mathematical derivations for deriving a custom sampling algorithm for this particular model. Now, of course, if you wanted to do that, that would be a really cumbersome workflow, right? You have your cool model, now I want to run it. Now I have to like go to the backboard and derive all kinds of equations to build my custom sampler. But these type of Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms, um, like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or NUTS, just right. work on pretty much whatever model you throw at it. And yeah, so it's one sampler to solve all your problems. Um, so that's why I love it. Nice, yeah, and we talk about those a lot. The the no U turn sampling, the nut sampling, we talk about that a lot in episode five yeah. or seven with Rob Tranguchi. If people want to hear a ton about that, uh, yeah, thanks for explaining your love for MCMC, and <laughs> yeah, we'll be sure to include a link to your blog uh, so that people can check out that amazing uh, blog post on Markov Chain Monte Carlo, and I also. Um, while you were speaking, I was multitasking and I dug into a number of the things we were talking about related <laughs> to the Beatles and that song. So first oh, of all, nice. the amazing Martin Scorsese documentary is called Living in the Material World. So it's George Harrison, Living in the Material World is the name of the documentary and it has 86% on Rotten Tomatoes. I loved it, but be prepared <laughs> for a long view because it's three and a half hours long. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so I broke it into two parts, but really stunning documentary and goes into uh, a great history of a super interesting uh, Beatle, my favorite Beatle. His, his songs are some of my favorites. And you were right. So George Harrison did write, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Um, however, interestingly, 
um, in the recording of, uh, of it on the White Album by the Beatles, um, Eric Clapton is playing lead guitar, but he's not credited for it. Um, no way. Yeah. Huh. Um, and why would he do that? Why would he have Eric Clapton <laughs> <laughs> play guitar and then not credit him? Um, so well, awesome. actually, I have the answer for you right here, which is that because by that point, there was a lot of infighting between the Beatles. And oh, right. so um, time, Lennon and McCartney didn't like the song. They didn't want it on the album. And they were apathetic about the song. And so by bringing Clapton along to record, uh, it helped get it onto the album, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, the woman who was in the love triangle with Clapton and Harrison is named Patty Boyd. And many of Eric Clapton's most famous songs are about Patty Boyd, including Wonderful Tonight, Layla, and Bell Bottom Blues. They're all about Patty Boyd. Um, but my, my memory of exactly, so while Eric Clapton was very uh, indiscreetly interested in her, apparently she was never um, actually with Eric Clapton until she left George Harrison due to him apparently being uh having a lot of <laughs> drug use and infidelity uh including apparently according to this article with Ringo Starr's wife um oh man this goes deep yeah so there you go uh <laughs> it's what everyone wanted no, in this no, what I'm episode yeah <laughs> exactly um, awesome. so now that i have completely segued us away from the technical stuff it gives us actually a good opportunity to talk about um, business aspects of what you do, which I think are really interesting anyway. So um, I'd be interested in hearing from you how you have built a successful company culture. So it isn't that long ago. It's uh, less than two years since you created PyMC Labs and the company seems to be doing well. You've got a lot of really talented developers and statisticians working with you. So um, how, did you, how did you build this? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it has been really interesting for me to do this because uh, I mean, I, I don't have an MBA, I didn't study business. I have some startup experience from Contopian and the culture there, and I always loved the culture there. So it was just very open and collaborative and they also really were proponents of open source. And a lot of that I, I copied, but also then extended in various ways. And I did early on do some research on different organizational principles and found some really interesting resources. So one of the books that I thought was really cool was uh, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Leloup. And he talks a lot about company culture and also the, the difference in different styles. And for me, it just really opened the my mind towards that not everything has to have like a strict hierarchy of like um, interns and uh, junior and senior developers and then project managers and VPs and like all this like thing, but then you could also relax these assumptions and have just um, not no hierarchies at all, but uh, fluid hierarchies um, and just have uh, rely more on self-organizing principles. So that is really what I have been trying in building with PyMC Labs. Now, a lot of cards are stacked in our favor because we already have been working together. Um, but um, and, and had already established a certain style of working together from open source. And so I knew that it was going to be very important to try and maintain the style of working together in open source, which is also much more um, driven by being self-motivated, right? Like people, you can't tell people in open source what to do. You can, uh, and, and they're not getting paid usually for it. I mean, now they are, but um, for the most part and before Pines and Labs, they, they weren't. So it really relies on people being motivated to do certain things. And it's not that you can direct that, right? So you can say like, oh yeah, like these are the things that we need to do. And then you can ask people and be like, hey, isn't this something that is cool and excited? So you're trying to nerd snipe someone to um, thinking something is cool and then working on it. But 
And that might sound inefficient for a company, but it turns out um, that that's not the case. Um, so I think it's just um, very, a very powerful way of running an organization um, to not like have very strict um, sort of project management and like task to-do lists and, and KPIs and OKRs and like all of this and you measure everything and people need to um, do stuff that looks amazing because they uh, want to hunt for the next promotion or the bonus. And I think a lot of that is probably well intended, but not really effective. Um, or, or maybe it is effective in some companies, in some aspects, but I think it has severe downsides. And one of them is, I think it makes people miserable a lot of the times. So, uh, once you have like infighting, right. And like, I want to get that promotion. So I, and you shouldn't get it right. So I definitely probably not going to be very collaborative in this setting, um, which is good for me, but not good for the company. So why would you want to incentivize that type of behavior? Right. And um so so yeah it was clear to me that i wanted to do something different that was in that very same open source spirit where people just do things because they're really motivated to do them and they want to and they're incentivized to do the right thing for everyone involved for the whole company and there are a couple of things actually that um we have built into the structure that is um supportive of that and a lot of that, I have to thank Tom Vladek for, who also runs a um, very cool, successful company. Um, and so, so yeah, he basically proposed this idea of um, having a, a structure in which, um, I mean, I don't need to go into the details, but, it's, but it is transparent, where everyone knows how much everyone else is making. Oh. And there are bonus payments, but... Uh, the bonus payments are basically also calculated according to a formula, right? So basically it's the more you have contributed to a certain thing in terms of times, the larger that percentage of the bonus is. So that way there really is no incentive to like try and appear as if you're doing like really important good work. Um, like there's, there's just no, no benefit of, of, of looking good. There is only benefit of like doing good. Um, right. because that sort of reflects well on the company. It's uh, making the client happy, uh, which is, of course, what we want. It makes everyone else in the company happy if you're a nice player. And it increases the revenue for the company, which increases the pay for, every, uh, for, for that person and everyone else. So, yeah, these type of levers are really uh, powerful, I think, and have this more communal um, effect where yeah we just like all um, have each other's backs and and support each other and I found that to be so critical because um, I mean everyone also goes through stuff in their life right so uh, some people yeah just have regular life stuff happen to them have crises and they need some time out or support in whatever other way. And, uh, and yeah, so we invite everyone to be open and transparent. And I'm with, I'm like that too, with my people where like, I know if I'm not feeling great, I let them know. And, and that way then like we all rally together and like sort of just try and find the best solution to support that. Um, and for me, um, it just created just an amazing work environment, um, where it's really fun to work with friends every day on like really amazing, challenging data science problems and contribute to open source and just, yeah, make, make the world better in the ultimate spot. So, uh, yeah, so that is, this is just something that I'm really, uh, have been excited about and, and I'm really excited about actually working. Right. So it could have also just like not worked, uh, because no one was doing anything, uh, but yeah. Um, so relying on, I guess, the self-motivation of people and building a system where yeah. they're actually excited and happy to do the right thing. Yeah. I think that there would be a lot of organizations out there where this kind of relying on people to be motivated and excited about solving problems uh, kind of bottom up wouldn't work. But when you've got top contributors to an exceptional open source library, uh, I can see how that is the right approach to go with and probably people really appreciate the extra um, latitude that that provides each of them. 
So that sounds super cool. Um, so speaking of your company culture, um, is there anything in particular that you look for in people that you hire? Yes. So it's definitely this being self-motivated. Um, that yeah, I think right. is like the most yeah. critical thing. Um, and we do, um, because we don't really have strong structures, um, which are for us the right thing, just because uh, the things are so fluid. I mean, we're really researchers working on ill-defined research problems, which require really creative solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it needs to be uh, people who like can operate in this like very uh, nebulous environment where uh, yeah, things change and are very fluid and, um, and you just need to be um, self-driven to solve these types of problems. So that is one. The other one, just on the technical side, is definitely open source contributions. So, um, so far, almost everyone we hired is a PyMC core developer, um, mm -hmm. but at the very least has contributed to PyMC. Um, because that that is already a great demonstration of these type of things, right? Because that is someone who's like just excited to to do this type of work, and yeah, uh, but also like for Bayesian modeling, I mean, it's, it's I mean now it's becoming uh, financially more lucrative to invest in this, but before, not really. So the people who did that were just like, oh, this seems like a cool thing. Uh, let me just do that. Uh, uh, yeah, and then just, uh, I guess, the the type, uh, and also in general, I would say the type of people that um, at least PyMC team um, got were like, are just like very collaborative and, and low ego. So that also really helps with, yeah, working together in this setting. Awesome. Yeah, super fortunate that you have this, this pool of great candidates that have like yeah. self-identified as really strong prospects for your consultancy. The best hiring funnel already. you could imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're kind of like in an ongoing, they don't even know it, but they're in a continuous job application process where like they are submitting uh, code for PR reviews <laughs> and you get a sense of like, who's really strong in this pool. Cool. Exactly. All right. So, uh, beyond PyMC, which we've obviously talked about a lot already in this episode, are there any other tools or approaches out there that you're really excited about these days? So one really cool thing that I came recently across and has rocked the Python world, definitely the PyData world, is PyScript, which was presented by Peter Wang at the PyCon keynote that he gave. And it's it's I, like to me, it's still magic. Um, but basically what it is, it allows you to run Python in the web browser. And oh, there, have wow. been, there have been approaches like that before, right? So, well, just to take a step back, um, the first thing you do when you want to run a Python program is you go and download Python through, for example, the Anaconda distribution, right? So that installs it locally on your computer and then you can run it. But of course, the web um, has revolutionized the way we run programs. A lot of it is just apps now and they don't require installation because you have a web browser and that is sort of the standardized compute environment. And so far, JavaScript was the only language for web browsers, but now there is Python as well um, through like a fairly, uh, well, actually the tech stack behind it isn't that crazy. PyoDi is like one of the tools in WebAssembly. But the end thing is instead of JavaScript, well, now you can just run Python in the web browser and do everything that you would otherwise do with JavaScript in Python. Um, it's not an either or, right? So actually the two interact really nicely, but uh, now, it, well, and the really crazy thing about it is that blew away me is it's not just like standard Python, but it's actually uh, also the almost the full PyData stack. So it's, um, Pandas and Matplotlib and, and, and also PyMC, which I recently got to, to run. Uh, I'll put yeah. link to that blog post in the show notes. Uh, so, so yeah, like now you can just, for workshops that we're doing at, at labs, um, people don't need to install. They can just go to the website and just directly 
run IMC there. You can build interactive web apps with IMC just running in the browser. And yeah, so for me, that's magic and it's amazing. And it just opens up Python to like a much wider audience. Um, so in, uh, in his talk, um, Peter says that like uh, he has some numbers on like that actually like 1% uh, are like Python programmers and then yeah, just opening it up to the other 99% um, who can now run that. So yeah, that for me is like the most exciting new development and something that I was very eager to play around with and eager to see where it goes. So I think that's going to just be revolutionary to the whole mm -hmm. Python pilot ecosystem. Yeah, that is revolutionary. And this is the first that I've heard about it. So super exciting. Thank you for sharing that with me, Thomas. No doubt lots of our listeners uh, will be excited by PyScript as well. So uh, PyScript aside, obviously we have focused uh, primarily in this episode on PyMC and Bayesian statistics. So how can a listener who's interested in either getting started with Bayesian stats or maybe brushing up on their Bayesian stats What's the best way that they could do that? Yeah, so um, there's the PyMC documentation page with that, which has tons of examples. Uh, there are many really cool books um, out there. There's one by uh, Junpeng Lao and uh, Ravin Kumar uh, and Oswaldo Martin. That is really cool. But also, um, with Alex Andorra and Ravin Kumar, I have been working on an online course that will come out um, any week now that is called Intuitive Bayes. And it basically stems from uh, what I alluded to earlier when I was um, talking about MCMC, where like, well, there's the mathematical description, which is like completely unhelpful. Uh, but the, the, the concept behind it is actually not that hard. So you can explain it in an intuitive way. And, and really that has been the motivation for my blog, which I've been writing for many years, is like making these concepts easier to understand for someone who does not have a PhD in math or statistics. And this basically uh, now is the culmination of like years of thinking about how to explain Bayesian modeling in the most intuitive way possible. And we have basically put that into a video course with, um, with presentations and notebooks and exercises. Uh, where we basically go through and like explain it to someone who is not really familiar uh, with it, but maybe knows Py like a software engineer who knows Python or a data scientist who knows machine learning, but wants to learn from Bayesian modeling, or just someone who like wants to have a deeper intuitive understanding. That um, yeah, we basically start from um, from very little, from nothing, and then build it up uh, with a focus not on math but on code and building intuitions. So yeah, um, that's intuitive base, and and I'm I'm really excited about it. Like it has been this vision that I have had for many years of just yeah finding a different approach of teaching this material, which is often taught in a very obscure way, but it really doesn't have to. Like it's much simpler than people make it out to be. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, people will find that valuable. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the excellent podcast learn Bayesian statistics by Alex Andorra where he has like all kinds of incredible guests uh, from the, the Bayesian world explaining all kinds of aspects of Bayesian modeling so also check that out I love that I can't wait to study your intuitive base course uh, I am a little Bayesian grasshopper who is so excited about it and I have used IMC uh, in my PhD 10, 15 years ago, I was using Winbugs on a Mac. So I had to figure out how to nice. like, oh, do, I had to dual boot Windows on my Mac in order to be able to, or like emulate it. I had a, an emulator for running Windows wow. on my Mac so that I could use Winbugs. Um, so I've been dabbling in Bayesian stats for a long time, but um, I, I don't feel like I understand it very well. And there's so much more that I could be doing. So I can't wait to check that out. This kind of this intuitive way of learning, it is similar to the approach that I took in my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, where, yeah, we cover some of the essential math, but the idea was to use visuals, illustrations, to as much as possible uh, have a high level understanding of what's going on so that you can, you can get into the libraries, you can understand the application areas and start applying them 
and get excited about the area. And then, so all the content that I've been creating since <laughs> has been like, okay, now let's like, if, if you're excited about this field, now let's dig into how it actually works under the hood in a lot of detail. Um, so this intuitive base, um, pedagogical approach, pedagogical. Yeah, I got that right. Mm -hmm. Uh, is the, uh, is, is, yeah, it's got my blessing and I can't wait to check it out. So, um, beyond that course and beyond the Bayesian stats book that you recommended that I will look up and include in the, in the show notes, do you happen to have another book recommendation for us? I always ask yes for one. Sure. Um, technical okay. or just in general? Could be anything. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mentioned the Reinventing Organizations book. I like that. Oh, uh, yeah. That's um, great. My favorite book uh, is probably Hyperion by Dan Simmons, which is like a uh, science fiction book. Um, so that one I would recommend. And then another one, uh, I mean, I, because I'm now diving deeper into like the, the whole business aspect, uh, never split the difference is like a book on yeah. negotiation styles. Um, I really enjoyed that, and uh, and yeah, I've been applying it uh, to to great effect. So uh, yeah, I would check that out as well. Well, yeah, we've had a few guests mention that uh, recently, um, or at least one. I don't know. It's come up. It's come up <laughs> recently. I can't remember the exact details, but that definitely seems to be a book that people love. Never split the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to be worth checking out. All right, Thomas. This has been an awesome episode. I've learned a ton. So hopefully the audience has as well. Um, how can people be following you to stay up to date on the latest that you and PyMC, the uh, software library, as well as PyMC Labs, the consultancy are up to? The best place probably is Twitter. Um, so TWiki um, on Twitter. We also have a PyMC Labs Twitter account. Um, most of my blogging these days I don't do on my blog, which is twiki.io, um, but I do on pymc-labs.io. So we have a blog there where me and like uh, other people from the labs team are publishing the blazing greatest stuff. So if you, for example, are interested in the PyScript one, you'll find that there. Um, or running PyMC large scale on coil computing um, and Dask uh, that's, that's on there. Uh, also, the HelloFresh stuff that I mentioned, that is on there. Uh, so yeah, those are the, the channels where I'm, I'm sometimes active. Super cool. We will be sure to include links to all of those in the show notes for listeners to check out. Thomas, thank you so much for being on the show. And maybe in a couple of years, we can check in on how you're doing and have another super informative episode. I love it. Wow, what a blast learning from Thomas today. Brilliant, fun, and easygoing dude. I think he's going to have a lot of success with PyMC Labs. In today's episode, Dr. Weehy filled us in on how Bayesian Stats is the modular Lego approach to building data models, how the PyMC library allows us to automate the sampling of probability distributions and estimate Bayesian models, how media mix models are an example of how Bayesian models can be uniquely effective for tackling large scale data problems how hierarchical Bayesian models provide extra flexibility and power for representing real-world complexity, how fluid hierarchies, pay disclosure, and a clear algorithm for bonus computation can enable employees to be both impactful and satisfied. We talked about the revolutionary PyScript library for running Python within a web browser's HTML, and he filled this in on the Intuitive Bayes course for learning Bayesian statistics um, intuitively uh, yourself. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Thomas's Twitter profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 585. That's superdatascience.com slash 585. There were lots of book recommendations in this episode, weren't there? Um, if you like book recommendations, check out a detailed spreadsheet of all of the book recs we've had in the nearly 600 episodes of this podcast by making your way to superdatascience.com slash books. All right. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana Siebert, Mario Palmo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogvang, and Kirill Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another killer episode for us today. 
Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.